every other administration around the world cares a lot about AI. And the question is, you know, we're in a sort of a bipolar world, at least with U.S. and China, but Europe and, and India and all these other countries are, are saying, no, actually, we're going to have sovereign AI as well. How does Microsoft navigate, you know, the difference of the 90s where it's like there's one country in the world that matters, right? It's America and we do, we, our companies sell everywhere and therefore Microsoft benefits massively to a world where it is bipolar, where, hey, Microsoft can't just necessarily have the right to win all of Europe or India or, you know, Singapore. There's actually sovereign AI efforts. What What is your thought process here? Yeah, and how do you great, think about this? It's, it's I think, a, a super, you know, critical um, piece, which is, um, I think that the key, key priority for the U.S. tech sector and the U.S. government is to ensure that we not only do leading innovative work, but we also collectively build trust around the world on our tech stack. Right, because I always say the United States is just an unbelievable place. It's just unique in history, right? It's 4% of the world's population, 25% of the GDP, and 50% of the market cap. And I think you should think about those ratios and uh, really, and reflect on it. That 50% happens because, quite frankly, the trust the world has in the United States, whether it's its capital markets or whether it's its technology and, and its stewardship of what matters, at any given time in terms of leading uh, sector. So if that is broken, uh, then that's not a good day for the United States. And so if we start with that, which I think the, you know, President Trump gets, the White House, David Sachs, everyone uh, really, I think, gets it. Uh, and so therefore, I applaud anything that the United States government and the tech sector jointly does to, quite frankly, for example, put our own capital at risk collectively as an industry in every part of the world, right? So I would like, in fact, the USG to take credit for foreign direct investment by American companies all over the world, right? It's kind of like uh, least talked about, but the best marketing that the United States should be doing is, it's not just about all the foreign direct investment coming into the United States, but the most leading sector, which is these AI factories, are all being created all over the world. By whom? By America uh, and American companies. And so you start there and then you even build other agreements around it, which are around their continuity, their legitimate sovereignty concerns around whether it's data residency, whether it's even what happens um, uh, for them to have real agency and guarantees uh, on privacy and so on. And so, that, in fact, our European commitments, I think, are worth reading, right? So we made a series of commitments to Europe on how we will really govern our hyperscale investment there, uh, such that really European uh, Union and the European countries have sovereignty. We are also building sovereign clouds in, in France and in Germany. We have something called sovereign services on Azure, which literally give people key management services along with confidential computing, including confidential computing in GPUs, which we have done great innovative work with NVIDIA. Um, and so I think I feel very, very good about being able to build both technically and through policy this trust in the American tech stack. Mm. And how do you see this shaking out as you know, you do have this uh, network effect with continual learning and things on the model level. Maybe you have equivalent things at the hyperscaler level as well. And uh, do you expect that the countries will say, look, it's clearly one model or a couple models are the best. And so we're going to use them, but we're going to have some laws around while well, the weights have to be hosted in our country. Or do you expect that there will be uh, this push to have, it has to be a model trained in our country. Maybe an analogy here is like people would, you know, the semiconductors are very important to the economy and people would like to have their sort of sovereign semiconductors, but like TSMC is just better. And so semiconductors are so important to the economy that you will just go to Taiwan and buy the semiconductors. You have to. Will it be like that with AI or is there? Um, ultimately, I think what matters is the use of AI in their economy to create economic value, right? I mean, that's the uh, the diffusion theory, which is ultimately, it's not the leading sector, but it's the ability to use the leading technology to create your own comparative advantage, yeah. right? So that I think will fundamentally be the core driver. 
But that said, they will want continuity of that, right? So in some sense, that's one of the reasons why I believe there's always going to be a check a little bit to sort of some of your points on, hey, can this one model have all the runaway deployment? That's why open source is always going to be there. There will be, by definition, uh, multiple models, that'll be one way. Like it's kind of, the, you know, that's one way for people to sort of demand continuity and not have concentration risk is another way to yeah. say it is, right? Um, and so you say, hey, I'll want multiple models and then I want an open source. So I feel uh, as long as that's there, every country will feel like, okay, I don't have to worry about deploying the best model and broadly diffusing because I can always take uh, what is my data and my liquidity and move it uh, to another model, whether it's open source or on, uh, from another country or what have you. Mm -hmm. so Concentration risk um, and sovereignty, right, which is real agency. Those are the two things I think that'll drive the market structure. The, the thing about this is that this doesn't exist for semiconductors, right? You exactly. know, all refrigerators, cars have chips it, made in it Taiwan. It didn't exist until now. Until now, everybody is now like, like even, even then, right? America, you know, if Taiwan is cut off, there is there are no more cars or no more refrigerators. TSMC Arizona is not replacing any real fraction of the production. Like there, it is it, there, the sovereignty is a bit of like a, a scam, if you will, right? I mean, it's <laughs> it's worthwhile having it. It's important to have it, but it's not. A real, it's not real sovereignty, right? It's, and we're a global economy. We don't. We. I think it's kind of like Dylan saying, "Hey, at this point, we've not learned anything about sort of uh, res what resilience means and what one needs to do, right?" So it's kind of any nation state, including the United States, at this point, will do what it takes to be more self-sufficient on some of these critical supply chains. So. I, as a multinational company, have to think about that as a first-class requirement, right? If I don't, then I'm not respecting what is in the sort of policy interests of that country long term, right? And I'm not saying they won't make practical decisions in the short term, right? Absolutely. I mean, the globalization can't just be rewound, right? I mean, all these capital investments cannot be made uh, in, in a way at the pace at which. But at the same time, you have to kind of, like, if I, like, you think about it, right? If somebody showed up in Washington and said, hey, you know, you know what? We're not going to build any semiconductor plants. <laughs> they're going to be kicked out of the United States. Um, and, and the same thing is going to be the true in every other country too. Uh, and so therefore, I think we have to, as companies, respect what the lessons learned are, um, you know, whether it's, you know, you could say the pandemic woke us up or whatever, but and nevertheless, people are saying, look, globalization was fantastic. Uh, it helped the supply chains be globalized and be super efficient, but there's such a thing called resilience and we are happy, you know, we want resilience. And so therefore that feature will get built at what pace I think is the point you're making. It can't be like you can't snap your fingers and say all the TSMC plants now are all in Arizona and with all of the capability, they're not going to be. But is there a plan? There will be a plan. And should we respect that? Absolutely. And so I, I feel that's the world. I want to meet the world where it is and what it wants to do going forward as opposed to say, hey, we have a point of view that doesn't respect your view. Mm. So j just to make sure I understand, the idea here is each country will want some kind of data residency, privacy, et cetera. And Microsoft is especially privileged here because you have relationships with these countries, you have expertise in setting up these kinds of sovereign data centers and therefore Microsoft is uniquely fit for a world with um, more sovereignty requirements. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I don't want to sort of describe it as somehow we are uniquely privileged. Yeah. Uh, I would just say, I think of that as a business requirement I see. that we have been doing all the hard work all these decades and yeah. we plan to. And so my answer to Dylan's previous question was, I take these, you know, whether it's in the United States, quite frankly, uh, uh, when, you know, when the White House and the USG says, hey, we want you to allocate more of your, I don't know, wafer starch to uh, uh, fabs in the US, we take that seriously. Uh, or whether it is data center and the EU boundary, we take that seriously. Yeah. So to me, um, respecting what I think are legitimate reasons why countries care about sovereignty yeah. and building for it, as a software and a physical plant is what I, I would say mm. we are going to do. Uh, and as we go to like the bipolar world, right? US, China, yeah. um, there, is, there is a lot around 
you know, American tech does not, you know, it's not just you versus Amazon um, or you versus, you know, Anthropic or you versus Google. Yeah. There is a whole host of competitive com competition. How does, how does America rebuild the Great trust? Point. What do you do to rebuild the trust to say, actually, no, American companies will be the main provider for you. Um, and how do you think about competition with up and coming Chinese companies, whether it be, you know, ByteDance and Alibaba or DeepSeek and Moonshot? And so just to add to the question, one concern is, look, we're talking about how AI is becoming this sort of industrial CapEx race, uh, where you're just rapidly having to build quickly across all the supply chain. And when you hear that, at least up until now, you just think about China, right? This is like their comparative Great. advantage. And especially if we're not going to moonshot to ASI next year, but we, it's going to be this decades of build outs and infrastructure point. and so forth. How do you deal with Chinese competition? Are they privileged in that world? Yeah. So it's a great question. I mean, in fact, you just made the point of why I think trust in American tech <coughs> is probably the most important feature. It's not even the model capability, maybe. It is like, can I trust you, the company? Can I trust you, your country, and its institutions mm -hmm. to be a long-term supplier? May be the thing that wins the world. If you enjoyed this clip, you can watch the full episode here and subscribe for more clips. Thanks.